Hi everybody, it's Eric Trombley here from the Engineering Teaching and Learning Team. I'm going to be giving you this quick video on Remote Teaching 101. This is the Guiding Principles. So in this video I'm going to be introducing you to three guiding principles and then talking about them a little bit, fleshing them out a little bit to get you set up for your challenge. Okay, here we go. So the first one, inclusion, accessibility, accommodation. The second one, managing expectations clearly. The third one, optimizing for time and flexibility. I'm going to spend about a minute on each one of these just to give you a little bit more detail. Okay, the first one for inclusion, accessibility, and accommodation, really when I think about this, I kind of lean on this uh, principle of universal design for learning. Um, I'm drawing draw your attention right away to a source that I'm putting in the bottom of this particular slide. It's from the University of Guelph on the subject. I've put a bit.ly here. I actually saw this source on the Center for Teaching and Learning website here at Queen's and I found it really, well, really good. So inspired by what I know about UDL and what I read out that source, I'm just going to bring to you a few points to consider. So this idea of providing time for students to deal with tech issues and learn new tech. You have to do that for yourself as the instructor. I think a good strategy is also to do that with students. Secondly, providing the course materials and the assignments as early as possible so students can start early. So if you find yourself in the summer right now thinking about your fall term course, the time to start to work on it is now so that you can get some of these stuff done and up on on cue as quickly as possible. Providing ample time for assignments. Normally, I would say that uh, on average, instructors are very good at ballparking how much time it takes students to, take, uh, to do assignments. But I would say moving into a remote teaching scenario, build yourself a buffer there and make sure that you're giving students enough time to provide the assignments. Provide formative assessment opportunities, not just summative. So this is a situation where you could possibly take your assessment scheme and move it across the semester a little bit and have some uh, formative assessment opportunities early in the semester to keep people engaged. And then identify the required versus the optional material. And this is really important because their students are going to have a lot of moving parts uh, in a remote teaching setting and understanding which are the elements that are absolutely required for them to be successful with. Um, that has to be very evident. And then you can do this by providing a sequence list of activities each week. Uh, when the week starts, you know, do this, do that, do this, do that, and make sure those are the required elements of the week. And that will really set them up for success. Okay, I got a few more points on UDL for you, uh, or UDL related points. Uh, ensure that any anytime you get any third party materials that you're going to bring into your course, uh, make sure they're free of negative stereotypes. Um, certainly, I'm confident the stuff you're going to be created is going to be creating is free of negative stereotypes. But now is the opportunity to really think about uh, anytime you're evaluating something that's coming from a third party, um, make this assessment for sure. And then uh, you might want to consider elements of accessibility. So there's an OnQ accessibility checker, which you can find out about. If you're coding any HTML, making sure you've got your alt tags on your images is really useful. And then um, having a workflow for thinking about how you're going to caption your videos is important. So use the FAAS sample syllabus to communicate student supports. We talked about the degree of change that students are going to be facing around these student supports. And if you use this syllabus, it contains the right links to the right public web pages that communicates all the student supports. And it'll be the up-to-date information that'll be found there. And then consider the changing situational factors being experienced by students. So I would recommend that during the delivery of the course that you have maybe one or two sort of like informal check-in surveys where you can ask students a little bit about how it's going. And this can help you gauge if there's anything changing in their lives or in their experience as a student that you can actually respond to constructively and actually help them moving forward. And the last one maybe I'll share with you is Put all the material in one place. You know, finding stuff is always a huge challenge for students when they're dealing with multiple courses, multiple instructors. Put it all in one place, put it on your on cue, and then it's one stop shopping for students. So second guiding principle, managing expectations clearly. So I'll, I'll just touch on a few points here. So organizing your on cue page effectively. So include a begin here section. Very, very important. Call it begin here. There's no ambiguity around that word begin here or that expression begin here and uh, put everything in there, your syllabus, all your administrative stuff. If you have a formula sheet that's going to be used throughout the course, put it in the begin here section. Everything in the begin here section that's administrative in nature is really, really valuable. 
Populate all the dates on your on cue by the first day of class. I think this is very important. Students are really temporally focused and they want to know what's happening. And if they're using any aggregators to aggregate the due dates in your course, then uh, with all the rest of their courses, then having the dates in your on cue course will really help because it'll bring visibility to the milestones and the deliverables in your course into their aggregators. I think that's important. Having the assignments available before the first day of class is a good one. Of course, when students first go to class, they often open the syllabus and right away run to the assignments to get a sense of the workload. Uh, if they can then, um, furthermore, reach the actual assignment handout to get a sense of what's um, available to them and, and, and basically the effort that's going to be there, then that's really, really important. So having those assessment handouts, assignment handouts um, by the first day of class is great. Organize everything by week. Okay, provide a sequenced list of things to do. This is really important so that they know if they're in week two of the semester, they know immediately when they reach every single course, look for the content piece called week two, go in there, what is the list of things to do that's sequenced? When should I watch my videos? When should I go for a synchronous interaction? Everything is listed there. Again, one stop shopping. Include more detail in your instructions. This is something we've learned a lot from, again, lessons learned from two decades of online learning. Uh, the more information we get, the more structure we get, the better it is. It really reduces anxiety. So time to complete the activity should be listed there. Submission method, the late penalty should be there. Any kind of information about the grading rubric should be listed. Use on cue to manage your assignment submissions, the grading and the feedback. So a full 360 degree life cycle there for the assignment. And again, it's one stop shopping for the student, really easy to understand the workflows. Organizing your TAs to provide student feedback on assignments within seven days maximum. I think this is really good. Uh, telling your TAs that this is what, uh, the goal you're going to achieve and then telling your students that this is you're going to achieve it really helps, again, students understand the expectations. And then over here, the announcements tool, which I think is popular. A lot of people are using it already, but I would tell you that uh, continue to use it. Don't bulk email your class. Instead, use the uh, announcement tool on OnCue. I think it's a really great way to one-way push something to folks. And then at the beginning of the uh, week, it's a great way to summarize what you, what's happening. So you're transitioning to week three. These are the things we're going to be talking about in week three. These are the things you need to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then if there's any other information that you want to share with them, uh, discussion forum is really good to do. So consider learning how to use that tool as best as possible. And then lastly, we talked about getting back to students with their assignments in seven days. Uh, tell students how fast you're going to get back to them on email, okay? I, I really like 48 hours, and I like to tell them excluding weekends, and I think it's very, very important to tell them that that is the, you know, the level of interaction that they're going to get from you, and that's the expectation level. It's important to be clear. Okay, last guiding principle. Optimize for time and flexibility. So the idea is defaulting to asynchronous materials when possible. So video presentations, readings, worksheets, problem sets, work solutions, things like that. This will help simplify the situation. But I will say that I don't want to get in a situation where we're eliminating synchronous events. I think it's very important, especially engineering disciplines, where you need that interaction. You need not only the student to student interaction, but you need the student to instructor interaction. You need both of those two things. I could also say student to TA interaction. So uh, consider using the precious time found in your synchronous events for this interaction. And any way you have to push one way content, default that to asynchronous material. If you can, if you were meeting with your students previously uh, for three or four times a week, I think the win here is to try to reduce that. In a remote teaching setting, try to reduce from three or four to something like one or two, and, and that'll really help with flexibility. How about providing more than one slot per week to accommodate time zones? Um, that can be possible in some settings, especially for larger classes. You're going to have enough, perhaps enough TA resources where you could maybe have a tutorial in two, two different time zones. Uh, that would be interesting. Uh, in any case, what you want to do is uh, record the sessions and put it on a streaming server, like the Queen streaming server, or you're going to put it on uh, YouTube, whichever way you wish. Um, discuss this with your students, right? Uh, there's sometimes a privacy issue with recording these particular meetings, and I think that it, you're open for some opportunity to have a discussion with your students to find out where the accept, uh, you know, where, where the acceptable practices are for sure. Um, there's other tips around that if you want to contact us in the engineering teaching and learning team, we'd be happy to brainstorm that with you. 
And then for a typical undergraduate course that you would call just a lecture-based course kind of thing, you're going to design with time in mind. So design for seven to nine hours of effort per week. Naturally, if you have a course that is more worth more units, you're going to be designing for more time. But really try to think about the time in mind here. We don't want to overload the students past the designated time because that's a recipe for constraining their flexibility and just overloading them. And lastly, it's the revisiting of your assessment scheme. So um, there's an opportunity here to think about remote teaching and to think about how you're going to foster engagement over the entire 12 weeks. And one of the ways to do it is to use more actual assignments, but perhaps smaller, okay, in an effort to try to promote that engagement, like I mentioned. And you can balance the weight of the assignments across the entire semester. So maybe you decrease the value of your final proctored assessment, uh, and you take some of those marks and you spread them across the semester as well. And then again, if you can, don't, I would reduce the amount of proctored events. Don't eliminate them um, entirely as a matter of course. Really give some thought to this. If you do wish to eliminate it, that's fine. You're, you're going to have other alternative high-stake assessments in place. But um, if you are doing a, a, a large number of proctored events in your course normally, uh, the key here is taking um, steps to reduce that number. So there you have it. That's the video. Thank you very much for uh, sticking in with me. All the links that I've talked about in this video, I'm going to put in the description uh, below it. And of course, if you need to discuss this further, you can reach anyone on the engineering, teaching, and learning team at the email right here. Okay? Thank you.